Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. It's just me and my buddy John here. Uh, I'm Tyler from Plastic Weekly. This is John from Climbing Magazine and Climbing Business Journal. Make sure you go check out all the content that he writes and produces for those two outlets. And of course, he's the author of A High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Did I get that title right? I didn't pull up the picture this time. Perfect. Sweet. Still got it. Three, three yeah. years later, two years later. <laughs> uh, we're back after the Bricks and Boulder World Cup, which just finished up this weekend in uh, in a, I don't know what, a mostly German speaking town of Italy, which is always throwing me off. Anytime I see a redheaded Italian, it breaks my brain completely. I don't know what to think. Uh, but yeah, let's let's get right into it. It's just the two of us. We've had a bunch of World Cups so far this season and Innsbruck is going to be a grind of a comp and I know I'm you know I'm looking forward to the climbing but it's going to take a toll on the schedule so I think this might be a shorter episode before we do a big banger of one to close out the boulder season and start the lead season in Innsbruck um so maybe this will be a bit shorter John give me give me the headline from Brixen yeah, I don't, Ron, I don't want to start on too much of a down note here, too much of a downer, <laughs> but my headline would probably be the Olympics wreck Brixen, Oof. or maybe more specifically the Olympic prep wrecks Brixen, or maybe if we want to get even more specific, the athletes leaving the boulder circuit to go train lead, presumably to perform better in the combined discipline at the world championships, which will be an Olympic qualifying. So event. you have, you have more tact than I do as you said, the Olympics wreck bricks and not the athletes wreck bricks and by not showing right. up. See, that's, that's right. the mistake I made. All of that in there, T pick yeah. and choose whichever aspect people want to focus on, but that, that wrecked bricks and all of that. I mean, th think about, let's help me out here. We had no Yanya Garnbrett at this event. We had no Orion Bertone at this event. We had no Brooke Rabatou at this event. And she was we supposed had, to be there. She canceled late, yeah. Yeah, we had no Mejdi Schalk at this event in the men's division. We had if no... I'm, if I remember right, this was a French write-off. The French just all... it was They were never going to come to this one. Yeah, and we had no Miho Nanaka at this event, which I, I think normally this day and age might not be headline news, but the fact that she did have this this win this season earlier this season that's that becomes significant that miho is not there and when you start having the stars and the standouts for earlier in the season when you start losing them you also start losing storylines and this is nothing new i we, i feel like we've said this every debrief so far which is oh the, these these people are here last week gone this week right we've kind of seen them pick and choose which competitions they want to be in. And we've said you have to take whoever wins kind of with a grain of salt, even though we don't really like to do that. Uh, but if there's no Yanya there or if there's no Orion there or if in other events, if there's no Natalia there, it's just getting to the point where all of these people not being there is becoming the bigger story then who is there, right? Like I'm, I'm sitting, I'm living proof because this is my headline. My headline is that all these people were not there um, you got to give credit to Matt Groom on commentary. I wrote down, he said, uh, he said, oh, that leaves the field quite wide open at the moment, which I wrote down. That's pretty much <laughs> the best optimistic way anyone right. could could spin the absence of so many superstars. Just glass half full. It's anybody's game. Can t yeah, that's true. You know, good on Matt for that. But I think the downside of all of this in the long run will be I'm worried that this will be kind of a forgettable season when we look back on this year, when, you know, historians, comp fans in the future look back on this year. I just think there will be so many of these asterisks by the name. Oh, this person wasn't there. This person was I just think people will kind of forget this season and and move on to you know, the world championships this season and, and the Olympics. And, yeah, this one might kind of fade away. That's too bad because we have seen some really awesome stuff this this boulder circuit i want to yeah for actually first thing I wanna, can you hear the soundtrack from greece coming through my microphone by any chance i'm like the the, the baseline to you're the one that i want is is just plowing through the walls um i don't know if there's a karaoke party somewhere else but anyway if you can't hear it it should be fine i uh, i hope not because we'd have to pay royalties probably <laughs> yeah, if that probably happens would. so just mute yeah. the whole podcast right um okay so i made a i made a tweet just kind of try, 
using uh, using some numbers uh, to try and explain like why I wasn't very excited about the finals and the two numbers I, I came across that were just really easy to find because it was in between semis and finals and so it's like the morning here and I'm tired but I basically like just looked at what the average uh, final placement was for the six female finalists over the last three years and you know Natalia's was like 1.7 right so that's her average placing uh, which means usually comes second <laughs> basically um, but for all the others it was far outside of outside of top three and for many of them it was far outside of top six and then of course uh, what their highest placing was over the past handful of years and uh, again um, very few of them uh, had ever come first or second. It was really just um, Natalia, if I remember right, was the only one that had ever come first or second uh, in a Bowler World Cup. And uh, someone on Twitter, a couple of people on Instagram, kind of were... I get they probably thought I was being like disrespectful to the climbers, which is not at all what the the point was. The point was this is I'm having trouble getting excited about this because it's real there really is no fight here it's clear who should win if natalia doesn't win it's not going to change very much about how we think about natalia or whoever wins right if johanna farber happened to win this world cup it would do very little to change what i think about johanna farber um and I think you and I probably need to, not that we should change what we do, because you and I like talking about climbing together for this reason, but you and I enjoy the historical element and the the immortal element of what happens today will matter for forever kind of element of sports, which is trying to build up the build up the stories and keep track of some lineage of the greatness in climbing. And that's a lot of what attracts me to watch a World Cup and to see how those those people at the top interact over long periods of time. That's like that's what I love. But there are some people that will watch a World Cup and and I don't know if if they enjoy you know, just they, they like seeing climbers have a good time and top boulders or maybe they're they take like a kind of a root setting angle and they really like seeing cool moves. Like there's certainly a lot of market for that. You see the all the YouTube channels that are really just replaying the, the tops. Right. So you can see what the moves were, what the boulders look like. There's a lot of reasons for people to like sports and none of them are none of them are bad reasons to enjoy watching sports. But for you and I what we like was really not present, particularly in the women's field at this World Cup. And uh, I think there's still a lot of people that enjoyed it. Maybe the viewership was down because when people tuned in, they're like, I don't know if I know half of these names, right? Uh, at least as boulderers. Um, but uh, I think I think it was probably worse for you and I than it was for a lot of other viewers, because I think we might be a little bit niche uh, compared to compared to the, you know, the typical viewer. Yeah, and I don't want I don't want this debrief to always turn into a Yanya discussion, but you can you you almost can't avoid it because think about how the the IFSC and and comp climbing at large for what it's worth has kind of been just building Yanya up for what like since her since her sweep in 2019, right? Essentially, like pre-pandemic, it, it's just been this this slow development of Yanya as the big thing in the sport, the big name, the big celebrity. And she's the star of the climb for gold documentary. And she's the, the Olympic star and all like star power matters. And people care about that. And if you spend three or four years getting people invested in a big star, and then that big star isn't there, you, you can't be surprised when the response is kind of, Ho hum, you know, and yeah. and I'm not saying that to the IFSC, like they can't control, you know, whether an, a, a competitor is there or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it to to Yanya either, because Yanya doesn't have to be there if she doesn't want to. She clearly has a training plan that she's sticking to, and and a plan to climb again in Innsbruck and at the World Championships and all that. But it just it just makes for this experience where you come away. And you're thinking, yeah, like there was some great stuff and we'll get into the, some winners and, and all of that. But you're also kind of like, gosh, so many people were absent. This is going to be a weird season when you look at it historically. Well, the, the one that knocks me out is like, this is a very competitive season to win the 2023 World Cup right now. And you, you just you kind of say to Brooke, like you're you are the favorite to win this season. Right. You can you can you can have it. It's yours. But then you don't show up to comps and uh, and and. And it's entirely up 
to her to to make her choices of what she cares about and it looked like she went and had some fun back at home uh saw her out with looked like her brother and some climbing friends and the and the boyfriend just having a good time which before this next swing of comps which is going to be brutal i imagine that's that's a nice thing for her but uh but it really does throw everything in uh uh into the air for this stuff and and not not in the pleasant way of like wow the five best climbers duking it out it's more like wow everybody went home so here's you know he basically that comp felt like an undercard honestly that's that that was kind of the vibe i got it was like oh this is the nice like tier two comp to warm us up for the for the tier one comp um yeah but yeah i wanted to to flip it a little bit um because fortunately due to the order of of the two days is we got the men's on the second day and you know that the men's field the men's field was certainly much better but the, the style of the comp it's all right not not professional today I just got alarms going off on my phone um the the way the field broke down on the boulders was actually fairly similar to the women's um but it was a bit of a slow comp and there was a couple people including in the discord and and some texts going around that like the uh the men's round was maybe a little bit slow compared to usual uh usual rounds but toby toby roberts saved brixen completely so if if the olympics ruined brixen toby roberts came back and resuscitated that thing right at the very end with his like full 60 second last minute send of men's number four and it really goes to show you know when you get lucky with those things how you know how much a good finish can make up for everything that came before it because all of a sudden we all had this moment to grasp onto and enjoy and be thrilled about and and now everybody's talking about it right like it was it was what i came into work uh to talk to people about everybody just wanted to talk about toby and that boulder and it was wild and it kind of made up for everything that came before it um it was it was pretty nuts how how that works and you're like man i wish we got these moments more often because climbing would be freaking amazing if we could structure it so it always ended that way but the, the how the men's final turned out or how it cut it funneled all into toby having to climb that boulder to win that just accentuated the sentiment that i was saying last week when we were talking about Prague. if you remember yes. the women's final and i was saying i don't ever like it when the final rounds end like this one did, where if, if you remember, uh, Orion comes out and she doesn't top the boulder, but she still wins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Yanya comes out and does top it, but she doesn't win. And I was yeah. just like, this is, just, nobody wants to sit there doing math, right? When they're watching this sports, they, they, they want to see somebody coming out. If you top it, you win it. Yeah. And Toby did exactly that. So it was the, the ideal way for a round to finish where somebody has to do that in order to win. I, I think you got to give credit to Do Hyun Lee, too, because oh, for sure. for as much as Toby did great things, you need a great sparring partner, so to speak, in that sense. And I think the fact that Do Hyun kept the pressure on Toby up until the very end, I think Do Hyun was maybe leading after the third boulder, if I remember correctly. I, I think uh, there was some real drama there. It, it was really close leading into that last boulder. So this, this just tells you how much my focus is on like history and narrative was that I decided like, you know what, I'm going to cheer on Do Yun because Mejdi let me down and he didn't give me my chance to see somebody win three in a row. I'm going to bank on Do Yun winning this boulder so that when we go to Innsbruck, Do Yun can go for that three in a row, which is like completely unlikely, absolutely bonkers to ask any male, you know, climber to ever achieve. But that's that I decided Do Yun was my guy because I still like I wanted that. I wanted that impossible narrative, which is ridiculous. But uh, yeah, no, Do Yun was excellent. And uh, and and like you said, him not doing enough is was really the crux of what made toby's toby's achievement extra special was you're like oh he could have had it Doyen could have had it this was his to lose um, it, it did kind of give us this new trifecta in the men's division of course in the women's division we talk about the trifecta between yanya orion and natalia and now in the men's division the, the trifecta i think it, it's it's anchored by mejdi for all the great stuff he did you have to say dohyun is is right there because he has the gold medal and he, and then he he almost i mean he did a, he had a really great final this here in brixen so he's got to be a, a leg of that trifecta and then i think we can kind of put toby tentatively there i mean we don't know sort of what he's capable of in terms of longevity which is always exciting for a competitor the the unknown okay he's proven he can do it now can he repeat it we will see but that 
trifecta, that triangle of Mejdi, Dohyun, and Toby is just as intriguing, I think, in a lot of ways as the trifecta between Yanya, Natalia, and Orion. My, my only concern is what if Toby goes the way of Hannes Van Dyson, where he, where he has like, you know, a couple like, well, who is this guy? And then just falls off or doesn't yeah. show up. Again, yeah, that's for, for both of these climbers, this is our first year of really seeing them as boulders, right? So it's like, it's very premature to make any long lasting statements, but that that is what makes them fun right now as we've seen like excellence, like real excellence from them against very difficult fields, right? Um, yeah. And I, I want to give a tip of the hat to Natalie Barry, because if people remember when we did our awards show uh, for last season and we kind of turned it into a preview of this season, Natalie was saying to watch out for Toby Roberts. He, he was kind of her pick. Do, do I remember her... right that she picked him as her breakout of, of 2022? Am I remembering that right? And I remember when I heard that, I was like, that's such a, I can't, like, I could not stand by that take. I was like, Natalie, you do what you want. But like, that's like absolutely absurd for me. He gets one bronze medal, right? He's barely competed in any comps. One's bronze medal. And that's going to be your pick. I like could not abide. But yeah. it turns out she was just predicting the future. So she had a, a really great prediction there. It turned yeah. out to be spot on. And uh, so I, yeah, we'll say I, it's just great. I think Toby, I mean, we'll get into him a little more, but he did give us one of the best uh, singular performances that we've seen, certainly in the last several years on the circuit, on that last boulder. So great stuff. Yeah. And I think the, I guess the, the final points about him, just context that a lot of people have probably heard, but of course the first win for, for Great Britain since Shauna Coxie retired um, and the first male bouldering win since 2007, right? There've been a few British men to win a world cup, but it's been a, <laughs> it's been a real long time um, since, uh, what was it? Andy, Andy Earl, Andrew Earl won, uh, the very small comp down in the in the in the Indian Ocean in the French territory of La Réunion. I think it was like what ten women competed, maybe twenty men or something. But it was a gold medal. You know what can I say? Just mm -hmm. the same way that I'm not going to say anything about Cheyenne So's silver boulder medal from this weekend. You know I'll just leave it as is. You can only compete against the people who show up, but that also means I'm allowed to criticize the people who showed up. Um, the, the one other thing I want to mention, which I can't believe I left it just before this was, and this is maybe, you know, pulling at stuff that, you know, viewers don't actually care about. But Toby Roberts now officially the fourth youngest man to win a Boulder World Cup. Um, he's just uh, slightly older than Mejdi when he got his win last year in Salt Lake City. Uh, and then, of course, Adam Andra and... and uh, uh, um, David Lama, uh, rest in peace, are, of course, ahead of him as the, the two youngest uh, men to win Boulder World Cups. But yeah, so cool little bit of trivia. He's one of the youngest to ever do it. So a nice little, uh, nice little bit of spice there. We've had the young guys showing up in the last couple of years. Colin Duffy's also on that list uh, right behind uh, Toby. Yeah, and we said this last week, I think, or two weeks ago at some point. Apparently, Toby's kind of a lead specialist or at least he was a lead specialist so for, what that's, so, so what that's, for what that's worth. And, and so... Uh, I, I feel like a broken record here because I, I think I said this before, but that you got to say that that puts him in a pretty good position to do really well at this combined discipline. Uh, and he seems to be peaking at exactly the right time. If he, I mean, at least if he can keep it up. So good on him. We will see what happens going into Innsbruck. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about winners. Um, of course I, I stole Toby, but do you got a, a winner you want to talk about? Yeah, I want to say that my winner is Natalia Grossman. We s sort of sang her praises at the beginning of this episode, but I'll just reiterate some of it. It was just as this competition went on, it was clear that Natalia was just kind of on another level compared to everybody else. I mean, that's really why you need Yanya there. You need Orion there because it did seem like there was a, a a bit of a gap between Natalia and a bulk of the rest of the field. I, I, what was interesting is if you looked at Natalia's qualifying round, she was not positioned near the top at the end. She was, I think, 11th place. And so yeah, she, she didn't get a top that other people got. Am I remembering right? So Boulder four, she didn't not, not only did she not get a top, she didn't even get a zone okay, on a boulder yeah. on a boulder that other women topped and other women flashed too oh, so wow. i am really curious to see that boulder i i'm just to see natalia get shut down on something that other people were able to work up i'm really curious about that but 
aside from that one boulder, she flashed everything else in the qualification round. And that's relevant because nobody else had a string of all flashes on the, like other people were able to flash all of those boulders kind of here and there, but nobody was able to string them together uh, throughout the qualification round. So Natalia flashed everything except for that one that she didn't get a, a zone or a, or a top, which makes it kind of this real strange anomaly. But so the point is she was pretty darn dominant. I think she was more dominant than her standing indicated in the qualification round. And then in the semifinals round, she cruised. And then in the finals round, she cruised, of course. And I'm thinking, okay, Oceana McKenzie, Ayala Kareem, Stasha Gejo, they kind of had the, the round of their lives, right? Or at least the weekend of their lives. And yet still Natalia was able to beat them all pretty handily. Natalia was just, she, she was just above and beyond everyone else. The exception being, of course, Che Yun So, who was able to, <laughs> also had the round of her life or the weekend of her life and was able to exceed, I think, all of our expectations for how she would perform in a bouldering competition, even though we've seen her do decent before. She kept some of that pressure on Natalia, at least kept it, pretty competitive because as I was watching, as that women's final wound down, I kept thinking, well, it's really good Cheyun was in this final because if it was, if Cheyun hadn't been here, which is not a gimme, right? Because Cheyun's kind of this outlier to make a Boulder final. If Cheyun hadn't been in there, it would have just been a slaughter of Natalia on the rest of the field. So and this is a throwback to Bricks in the last year where we said the exact same thing about having Henna Moyle there to act as Moyle is the foil. That's the, that's the, that's the new t-shirt slogan. So, um, ha have somebody to, to put a little pressure. Right. And I think part of that is, is actually not so much the level between them, but I, my winner is actually the boulders themselves um, and the root setters, whether it was intended or not, um, creating separation and creating difference between these climbers by really going into interesting styles and, and movements that, that often don't see this much fluctuation between the performance of one athlete from one boulder to the next. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it was Natalia's to lose. And I think, like I said earlier, if she had not come first place, wouldn't change that much about what I think about her or the person that would have beaten her. Um, but I think the boulders made it fun. Uh, they like uh, uh, problem number three, right, where where Natalia took like quite a lot of attempts in finals, uh, whereas Cheyenne flashed it and maybe some of the other women flashed it as well. Uh, just little things like that, like giving you giving you a reason to kind of second guess yourself and uh, and throw a little wrench in the cogs, right? spice it up a little bit and make it so that the top on that final boulder was mandatory. Um, you know, you gotta, you gotta amp up the, the attempts early on so that tops become really valuable at the end, uh, which is, uh, is, is, uh, what happened to Toby as well. Actually, Toby needed the top at the end. Zones wasn't going to do it. Attempts wasn't going to do it. Just had to be a top straight up, uh, as simple as that. Um, so yeah, the, the, what I want to talk about is my winner was the boulders. I had a lot of the different winners just in case I wanted to celebrate like how good Alana was on commentary. I wanted to, what was the other one? Uh, I, I'm going to leave the other one cause it was a little bit facetious. Um, but the boulders were great because they, I think they did a really good job of illustrating how they're how big of a difference there can be between climbers when it comes to certain styles and certain movements, especially when you don't give them the chance to watch each other's beta and you only give them four minutes. In both the men's round and the women's round, there were boulders set so that every single person in the field had a moment to feel like they were gods. Like everybody got a chance to flash something or really like overperform kind of, right? Everybody had that moment where they're like, I'm a master of this particular move, this particular block, I'm just killing it today. And then you go one boulder later or two boulders later and suddenly you feel, you know, you're, you're the, it's your first day of climbing at a gym and you can't get up anything. You're watching your friends get up this. You're hearing the cheers from the other climbers and then you're just completely flummoxed. You're like, how did that guy went in and out of ISO 10 seconds apart and now I'm down to like, you know, I'm four minutes later, cannot put together the, the, the move for zone on this boulder. And I thought it was such a fun, uh, a fun way of showing that the best climbers in the world 
can really have things that they struggle with. You can have bad days and good days. And the boulders that they're presented have a huge influence on who can win and who can lose. Um, yeah, that made it fun. That's what that's what that's what redeemed the women's round, and that's what gave us the excellent finish for the men's. So as much as there was a bunch of you know, I don't know if there was that much snarkiness from athletes about the qualifiers being too much of a flash fest on the women's side. Like we saw uh, Nico uh, Genuel, the coach from the French team, kind of you know mocking some of the other athletes who are apparently complaining that the boulders are why they didn't make semis or whatever um, i don't know if that was a sentiment that was actually shared by that many climbers or if it was just one conflict that got amplified uh, on social media but i think the finals were excellent i thought the semifinals were also excellent boulders um, so i was really excited this round just to, to have the opportunity to be like wow serato's looking awesome on this crap on this one adam getting his ass handed to him in semifinals like this was it was kind of a, a thrilling uh weekend of of boulders and uh there were some misses i know people talk about uh was it men's three with the kind of like weird zone placement off to the side that the the narasakis skipped if i remember both of them skipping it but i love the boulders in general you if you try weird stuff and you do cool boulders some of them are going to miss but all around i thought it was a banger like in terms of the climbs we'll put a placeholder on uh the narasaki brothers and adam Andre. we'll talk about them in a second but i <laughs> definitely yeah. something i really i i always think it's kind of a, an unofficial mark of a good competition if the boulders or or some moves of the boulders go viral in our little comp world sphere hmm. here right like people are sharing the video and go viral for how difficult the moves are but also not just difficult meaning like everybody got shut down on it but they go they go viral for how difficult they are and yet some people did send them i know that that's kind oh, of like yeah. a convoluted uh, no thing no this is a, this comp is a great example of exactly but what you're this, saying this is a great example and three things that come to mind that people seem to just be buzzing about three moves three boulders first of all there was that one in the semifinals if people watch the semis where it was kind of like a big slopey I think it was yellow. It was like a big slopey yellow dish, and the, and the men had to launch from it to these like this little crimp, right? And it was just like you watch it, you're like, geez, that is finger searing to try to not only just kind of stay stable on that on that sloper sphere, but then to actually launch and then actually to latch onto the crimp that I actually think had a a little blocker above it as well. That was an awesome boulder. That was an awesome sequence. And, and then let's see what else in the oh, oh of course the men's the final boulder, right? Those little under underclean crimps that were just s nothing there. Credit card crimps, uh, and just trying to have to have to hold on to those. We got so many close ups of the the climbers just <laughs> their their knuckles just like holding on for dear life, mm -hmm. and so that was great. And then I also think that the slab that Natalia struggled on uh, in the women's final that that move where she was kind of throwing to it. It was it was like slab, and then it got dynamic, and she was slow throwing to that slopey edge and she kept sliding off it. She tried and she kept sliding off it, sliding off it. That was a really hard, fun move too. And, and credit to her for actually to eventually dialing it in. But there were just, yeah, this, this comp was just filled with, and I could probably easily name three more if I would think of them, but this comp was just filled with isolated moves and sequences like that, that went viral for how hard they were. But people did not get shut down on them, which is the worst. You, you know, you actually, they were hard moves that were possible. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I thought you were going to talk about like when, when, because I know people were asking about like, what's the point of a zone if it's something that you don't even need, like separately going viral in that sense um, of people just like talking about the rules, talking about the mechanics of setting a boulder for competition. But yeah, I, I love it. And I think I, we got the bonus of the commentary amplifying those those moves because somebody would have a disaster of a four minutes on it and they would be talking about how incredibly hard this hold is there's like no texture on it it's impossible and then you know do young goes, goes up and treats the thing like a jug and, and you just like you, you can pick a moment where every athlete had that moment to look like a superhero after a boulder was made to look like it was impossible uh yeah so that that constant up and down of expectations really really sends makes everything that comes after it just more exciting because your expectations don't know where to go or we keep uh we keep defying your expectations sort of and it, it makes a little bit more thrilling in that sense
You know what Alana is so great at on commentary? This relates to what Gasping. we're talking about with these hard moves. The gas. Yes. <laughs> I was kidding. She but yeah. is so good at the at the at gasps and the kind of grunts of how difficult things are. Like, and it's it's really refreshing. I, I would be entertained if somebody would make a compilation video of just her her gasps. And and I don't even mean that as an exaggeration. Like, I think this would be really entertaining because I think. It's it's refreshing that she's not above that as a competitor because of all the all the people that you think wouldn't necessarily gasp at hard moves. It's a competitor who has seen thousands and thousands of hard moves in her comp career, right? But she's not afraid to just kind of be one of us and just like and just let it all just oh my gosh, this move. It's just it's it's the best. I hope she never loses that aspect of her commentary because I think it adds a lot, honestly. I do too. I'm, I wonder if, if she finds out that everybody is like aware of it. I wonder if that changes, changes how she'll behave in her head. So nobody, nobody tell Alana that the don't gasps change. are awesome. Yes. Don't say yes. anything. We don't, don't want to ruin Alana. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree though. Uh, like I said, Alana was going to be one of my winners, um, possibly just because I do think she's, she's an excellent co-commentator but more importantly she asks great questions and we saw this i think it was last year where they started uh i think we got stasia to do some and then alana to do some and both of them were asking like just climber nerd questions that you know rather than having to answer how are you feeling and and trying to trying to answer that with any kind of creative you know response finally you just the climbers the competitors are just nerds they're just climbing nerds they just want to talk about moves and and Atlanta gives them the chance to do that and talk about it. And I thought it was great. So, uh, yeah, big giant props to Atlanta for that. Yeah. Gasps absolutely. and all. Gasps and all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about losers then. We're cruising. We're rolling. This is going to be a, well, we're already at 30 minutes, but whatever. Well, we got Innsbruck looming. So yeah, we do. Yeah. Plenty of talking. Uh, would you like me to go first for the losers? Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, well, you were talking about the skipping the beta on that men's boulder, the skipping the or skipping the beta, skipping the dishes, I guess, the zone. Or oh whatever yeah, it skipping was. the zone on um, the red holds. Yeah. Yeah, my loser would probably be Tamoa, because he... I thought so I'm going to interrupt you real quick. I thought you were going to say it was the poor root setter that had to do the like this is how this boulder works preview immediately before the boulder just gets broken, and it's so funny because they only do that segment for one boulder in each comp, and then it has to be the one that like the sequence gets busted. But sorry to interrupt. So can I offer a recommendation to the powers that be for the yeah. root yeah, preview? Let's hear it. I, I love. I like that they're. I think it's great that they're giving the route setters some screen time and letting them explain their creations and stuff. But I would like to see, rather than the route setter just saying, this is what you do, I would like to see them attempt it. I want to see somebody on the boulder kind of showing us where the crux is, showing us what the moves are. I'm not saying that, I mean, obviously they might not be able to send it. They might not even be able to get very I was going to say, you're going but... to have to make them put their four running jugs back on the wall to help get them get them through the boulder. Yeah, but, uh, but that could be But at least cool. they could hop on and they could kind of point and say, okay, I can't do this swing, but ideally then somebody will swing. Just a little more uh, of a visual aid with the with that. But let's, back to the my loser. Uh, so Tomoa had a really solid qualification round. He had a really solid semifinal round. And then the, it just kind of fizzled in the finals. He The only one top that he had was that the, the one that all the men topped. It was the one you were talking about where the, there was those dishes and he, he and Meichi, Meichi, they ended up skipping the dishes and, and, and uh, leaning. Yeah, it was like the it was Pro Boulder three, right? It was the forced forced slab That's into right. an inside corner kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, and I think it was Meiji and Tomo were the two guys that did skip those. Yeah, um, it, we're just not. It's I'm just not used to seeing Tomoa get almost shut down by boulders mm -hmm. like that. I mean, he did. I know he did send that one, but he had to break the beta to do it. So, in terms of sending the boulders the way that the route setters intended, he kind of did get shut down maybe i don't know it was just a weird did he not showing. flash that though so I, I wouldn't say he got shut down like he 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 cruised that boulder he just didn't need what they you know, what i, I they don't want to i don't want to say he got shut down yeah he did not get for the shut other down, boulders absolutely. sure yeah. but he he almost got shut down uh on the uh, yeah on the others he got shut down and just a kind of unfamiliar territory for Tomoa, especially after looking so good in the previous rounds. And especially I thought some of those boulders would really suit him. 
So I was kind of surprised that he struggled on some of them, but probably just a, a you know bump in the road. I don't want to uh, pile on too much on Tomoa because he's obviously making it to finals still counts for a lot, and he did make it to finals. But I, I, was, I expected more. I was joking in the Discord, uh, tr- trying to like make light about the fact that Japan did have four men in finals, but that they were always in the bottom four spots. Like never, never did they overtake Toby or uh, or Doyen. So the joke was like, Japanese team is in shambles. They've all finished as low as they possibly can in finals. Meanwhile, you know, guaranteed, literally guaranteed a bronze without climbing any boulders. Um, but, but along the same, uh, you know, the same, the same avenue that you're going down, it's kind of like this, just like legends getting shut down in Brixen. Um, and a name that we didn't actually bring up was, um, let me, I'll, let me do a detour for the, for talking about the women's field was there's, there's five top women, right? It is Yanya who was not there. It was Natalia who was, but then Brooke, Miho and Orianne were not. And then the sixth person, let's say if you want like the typical finals, you might say that that sixth person is maybe Hannah Moyle. She would be a good contender for that spot, right? Um, and of course, she did not make it uh, into the finals cut, even against this field who you would say on a typical day, you'd expect she would do better than all of those women in bouldering, uh, aside from Natalia. Um, but then in men's, who my loser is going to be is Adam Andra, who, who absolutely got ruined in the semifinal. Uh, the men's semifinal was all down to those first two boulders, and he got nowhere on those climbs. Um I guess the reason I'm calling him my my loser for this is this was literally his worst ever IFSC Boulder performance in history. He's been competing for over a decade, um, and this was the worst he's ever done, finishing 19th place. Previous worst was 17th back at the Innsbruck World Championship uh, four or five years ago. Um, but this was as bad as it gets for Adam Andra, and of course, as bad as it gets is like semifinals. Um, but still... A lot of big names had had really rough rounds. And I think, again, it comes down to these boulders were highly variable. Um, you had to get on the right track with how to send them. Some of the beta ended up being pretty wild, like, you know, knees comes um, in, the, in, the, in the most important boulder of the round, possibly just like some, some goofy stuff. And he couldn't find it. So even worse than Tomoa kind of bottoming out in finals, Adam Andre bottoming out in semis was uh, pretty gnarly. Adam Andre is so hot and cold in term, in terms of his performance his relatively results. like relatively yeah right yeah. I mean in 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 the in the metrics that Adam Andre has set for himself yeah right, which is metrics that would far exceed those of most other climbers uh, yeah he's kind of hot and cold because you watch the the Prague event silver medal fantastic comeback performance come back to the circuit performance hard hard th- fought silver medal too though like he wasn't he wasn't perfect through those first couple rounds yeah and you think geez this guy he's yeah he's 30 years old but another world cup gold sometime why not another world championship mm-hmm. why not olympic qualification why not you know it kind of seemed like the world was his oyster at, after prague and then now he has this result and so and if you would riff off all those things that i just mentioned you would you would think far less likely for all of those things so you just don't know you i said in my in my recap of this event i said trying to guess adam andra's future in terms of what he might do on the comp circuit good luck we we have we have one event where he does really great and then one event where by his standards he doesn't do great at all who knows? And that, and I say that as an intriguing question. I, I think we're going to get a, a lot of that answered here as the circuit continues uh, and, and leading into the world championships. But it seems like you never know which version of Adam, based on these two comps, might show up at the World Cup. And it makes it even more interesting to say everything that you just said. But it's also true to say he is a favorite to probably like you know win the olympics right like there's a lot of new names that we could speculate about right that we just don't have enough information it's definitely possible mejdi uh with a good lead season becomes one of those people too toby roberts now on on the tip of everybody's tongue but you just have to look at adam's record and say yeah of course he's a favorite of course he's a favorite to qualify through the world championships like of course um but everything you said is also just true it fluctuates a lot right it's, yeah, and uh, let's not forget that Adam, being such a veteran of the circuit, being such a veteran of fame and celebrity, he's going to know how to deal with a lot of that just pressure that's inevitably going to come with 
Olympic qualification, if, you know, as people vie for Olympic spots, you would think that Adam Andre would be a little more uh, cool under pressure because he's he's kind of been through it all for so many years. And it's well, interesting when we're talking about a 16 year old or a 17 year old, that's that's a that's going to be a lot for them to to kind of wade through you would think some of them maybe not all of them but you know what i was going to say it would be interesting to actually do this count because i definitely cannot do it in my head but you look at like how many athletes from the 2020 cycle who were expected to do well like really had heavy expectations on them from the 2020 cycle how many of those are going to be around for the 2024 cycle like how many people are there like adam who can say I've been through this before, you know, I've, I've spent my entire career with no media presence. And then in 2020, they all showed up and I had all of this pressure from the media and from my national federation and from my national Olympic committee. And I went through that qualification pathway. He of course really struggled as it turns out through that pathway. Um, but, uh, he's one of the few people that's got that experience, right? Yanya of course is the other obvious one, but a lot of the other names that went in with expectations last time were towards the end of their career and are not going to be around this time. So I, I think that's a really uh, salient point to say he's one of the people that was supposed to win last time. He knows how it feels building up to and coming out of a failure at it. He might be the like mentally most prepared guy for what he is about to experience, even if he's a little bit old, even if he's a little bit out of the comp shape, right? He's That's a huge advantage. Yeah, and when you look at it from that angle, don't you think that, okay, of all those 2020 Olympians, people that are in a really good spot in the sense that they have that Olympic experience and yet they are still relatively young. It, like you're like, okay, Brooke, like great. She's in a great position. Uh, Cheyun So great position. Colin uh, to an extent. Colin Duffy to an extent. Yanya Garnbrett, obviously. Uh, yeah. It'd be an interesting exercise to start going. And then you look at like, okay, Akio's not there. Miho, I don't know. That's a big question mark because she had that, you know, she did have that one great comp this year. That but like Mio's last bunch of years have just been a struggle all around, exactly. right? And I don't think that has changed all that much, but but it is a good point, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting to kind of look at that. If you had a spreadsheet of the Olympians and their ages and who was vying for the Olympics this year, 2023, going to Paris, 2024, yeah, it'd be a fun little exercise to kind of see who who do you think mentally is in the best space in terms of being able to balance the hunger for to qualify for the Olympics and also having the experience from the previous Olympics. Yeah, that'll be a that'll be a fun uh, a fun look. Too bad there's so much going on in the news climbing wise. Like I know that's not going to be something. I, I somebody mentioned like it's time that I do a video for like how do you qualify for the Olympics for the people that are out of it. But I'm just kind of realizing, especially with the news out of. Uh, out of the IFSC that just dropped yesterday about the Russian athletes who are not going to be eligible. Uh, finally, uh, finally, a decision was made. I am grateful that there is clarity on whether or not the Russians are going to be able to be involved in this cycle, because I think that was probably killing them just as much as being left out of the the loop completely is just not knowing are we are we eligible to be in the cycle so the news about that and of course speed competition is about to start back up again bouldering is about to end leads about to start like there's so much to talk about you know aside from the olympics there's just so much going on it's uh it's this is the time of year that you, there's a million stories you could write a million videos you could create so we'll see what uh we'll see which ones actually end up being being produced when we have the time but the yeah. uh, the world games are going to debut a four lane speed which is something we talked about wanting on this show a year or so ago <laughs> and and I know has is something that had existed mm -hmm. in, I think, Soviet speed comps maybe in the past or, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we saw, we saw them in Asia and stuff, like we, particularly we since the homologated era, like these walls have existed and, and some countries have, have, uh, uh, have supported them and used the speed relay. But a thing I heard, and this is not confirmed, um, but uh, I don't know very much about the world games um, because to me, I always thought of the world games as like, oh, this is where sports go if they're not in the Olympics. So I was kind of confused, like, oh, can climbing be present as both an Olympic sport and as a world game sport uh, now that we're Olympic? Um, but uh, this person told me that um, uh, so long as the formats are different, so long as what we do in the Olympics is a different format from what we do in the world games, we're still eligible. So 
you know, so long as speed climbing is a bit different, maybe that's maybe that's why they're doing it. They're trying, you know, a bit of a relay thing, and and that could be really interesting. Am I going to watch it? Honestly, no. I'm going to take that weekend as a vacation weekend from watching comps, but it'll be fun to check out in hindsight. So if that's the if that's the reasoning, then why doesn't the World Games just have every Olympic track and field event but add an extra meter so like instead of the 800 meter run we do the 801 meter run and in, instead of the 1600 we do the 1601 it's not the same discipline technically you should you I, should run for president of the ifsc you've got all that you're the big ideas guy come on you can you know when marco finally decides to bail you're the you're the guy for that uh, we're gonna yeah. have five zone holds on our, on our borders i can't wait i cannot yeah. wait um, yeah, well, uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? Any little minor points you want to mention or anything before I, uh, close out this, uh, this quick one? Where were the smoke machines? I thought that was going to be a regular thing. Why, I, why didn't they pack those up from Prague and send Despicable. them along to Italy? Come yeah. on here. I, I thought I was ready for more pyrotechnics, not You know less. that, you know, that, you know, famous stereotype about Italians is that they have no flair, you know, they just, there's just no right. showmanship. The Italians is the most boring, <laughs> the most boring set of people in Europe. Um, we should acknowledge this was the, the return of Elnaz Rakabi on a, on a serious note here. She's back. Uh, that is, the, uh, I'm sure people listening to this know all the backstory there. This was her big return since the Asia continentals uh so good to see her back on the circuit of course and Can I, it's it is quite a reality check honestly when we're at the point where hearing that a competitive climber is like still alive is is something we're like oh good like finding out that you know the ukrainian climbers are like still alive is like okay good finding out that none of the old you know russian climbers are 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 dead as far as we know like good that's that's like quite a quite a hip check from from the world we live in um where that's a thing we actually have to think about is you know way beyond my pay grade man yeah and with the elnaz thing i even i was thinking about her return and i was when i was writing about and i was i think i wrote like it's good to see her back on the circuit like i just said here and then i'm thinking well wait a minute like is like, is that even okay to say? Because I want to make sure she's back sort of under her own volition, right? She's sure. not like being like, you have to perform for, I don't know. So, uh, and that's, that was part of the complication with her whole situation is trying to get news from reliable sources and, and directly from her. And even that was hard because, you know, you don't know if she's the one writing her Instagram posts and all of that. So, uh, she is back, and we will say that we, I mean, we're assuming she's back uh, in, uh, because she by wants her to own be. preference. Yes, and uh, so that was that was good to see. Um, everything I'm trying to think, I'm looking at my notes here. I don't, I, I don't think I have anything more to say. I, I, I want to see um, more dynamic, more slabs with dynamic finishes, to, because that seems to be the thing that shuts down the super women of the circuit this season with mm -hmm. Yanya and Natalia or, or almost shuts them down. Natalia figured it out here in Brixen, but uh, more dynamic slabs, please, because that seems to be the equalizer. Well, listen, the Boulder season for 2023 wraps up this weekend in Innsbruck. So make sure you're watching. We are going to crown a World Cup champion, whether or not it's shown on the stream and whether or not the athletes actually care if they get it or not. It's still something we're going to write down as a historical achievement. And of course, the lead season starts in the exact same weekend. We finally get to see these climbers back on a rope, seeing how strong they are when the climbs are longer than five or six moves. So that'll be fun, too. Uh, and then just just at this point now, like just a month, what, a month and a half away, two months away, we're going to be wrapping up the World Championships. So there's going to be so much climbing and so much debrief. Holy crap. And that's you know, not even to talk about the continental qualifiers, the Olympic qualification series, like this season's never going to fricking end. Uh, there's lots more to come. So I hope, uh, I hope the short episode came at a good time. We'll be back in just a week for the Innsbruck debrief. Then we'll take a week off. Uh, until then, we just want to say thank you for watching uh, all these episodes this season. As always, like it, subscribe it. You can support this podcast at the Patreon link below to get stickers, to get special Discord clout when you're talking about the comps with us. Make sure you follow John's journalism over at Climbing Magazine and at the CBJ. You can support both of those out at those outlets like I do. They support me. I support them. Support good climbing journalism. And uh, with that, let's end it. 
Thanks for watching the Brixen World Cup debrief, and we'll see you guys in the next one. My mouse is out of reach. This is an awkward ending.